if we took a look at any of those television shows, they look like they're the best buildings absolutely, in town. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And that's how they should be, because it, the deceased people should be treated with dignity. And when the relatives come in to identify the body, they should not find uh, mess, and they should not find, they should find likeness in, when you come to a hospital. It should look like that. Yes. Uh, and. Uh, at that time, it didn't. But it was still very dignified in spite of the environment because physicians have a way of uh, insisting that at least certain primary, basic things should work and should be available to them. And I felt very comfortable there. But when I came, I didn't believe that that was the building. So I looked through the little open, that little window in the steel door as you come into the building, and it said, and, and I looked in there and I saw 15 bodies that these guys were working on. And I said, well, that's my place. <laughs> and uh, then I went upstairs and there was the boss and he welcomed me and from there on, now here I was in America working as, um, in the profession which I chose. And how did you end up in the metropolitan Detroit area? Oh, one day uh, I decided that it's time for me to, to be chief someplace. And uh, the, uh, we have we medical examiners or people who work in the medical examiner's office uh, have meetings, national meetings. And there was a search committee set up by Wayne County uh, where they uh, asked uh, this search committee to find a forensic pathologist for Wayne County. And uh, I knew the, uh, one of the members of the committee who was a professor of pathology at uh, U of M. And he asked me, when do you want um, a job in, in um, Detroit? I didn't even know at that time where Detroit was. <laughs> uh, so I said, sure. I'll have a look at it. That's a great story. And that's how I came here, interviewed with these people on the 1st of April. And uh, uh, it snowed on that day. And what else is new? Here I said to them, you know, well, how come you have snow here on the 1st of April? Because in Maryland, there was no snow on the 1st of April. <laughs> they said, well, in Michigan, we have a rule. If it snowed now, in five minutes, it's going to be sunny. <laughs> and they went, and, and it to was. Be true. <laughs> Dr. Spitz, what has been the impact of these CSI shows or crime scene investigation shows on the general public perception of forensic pathology or interest in you it? You know, the one thing that I admire in those shows is how they are able to uh, solve a case in one hour with four commercials and everything is covered. <laughs> they have done the autopsy, they have done the toxicology, have they have conferred with the police, they have done everything under the sun in, what, about 45 minutes. Yes. And you know what? <laughs> that is misleading because it does not take that at all. It takes a lot longer and a lot more thinking. I lie in bed sometimes at night. I don't sleep because I'm thinking, how does such and such go with such and such? And how does this work to, to how did this accident or how did this homicide or how did this suicide, how did this happen? And, I, I, and it takes me at nighttime when I'm supposed to be sleeping, <laughs> recuperating from the day's chores f and prepare for tomorrow. How did that um, th that takes longer than the whole thing on television when you watch CSI. Well, maybe that's one of when some your mind is at rest and you can cl think clearly. But you're right. You're <laughs> right. When the no, when the phone doesn't ring, that is totally correct. <laughs> Dr. Spitz, you've been linked with some of the most noteworthy high-profile cases uh, in the media. Um, could you tell us what some of the roles are that you have played in, in some of those cases? And I, you know, I think some of our viewers, and I know I, I was, you know, just fascinated with what your role was in the assassination of President Kennedy, and you were sharing with me some of your uh, viewing <coughs> of the archives of, of President Kennedy. Well, the, um, I want to tell you uh, 
to start off with that the every single one of the well-known national cases that I've been involved with were the easiest cases. They are portrayed to the average individual as difficult, nobody can figure this out. Uh, 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 how did this all happen? And the pathologist uh, couldn't arrive at an opinion, or he did arrive an opinion, at an opinion, but the opinion wasn't really that great. And uh, those were the easiest cases. That's interesting. Well, let me tell you. Let me tell you. The in the in the in the case of uh, President Kennedy. The autopsy was done by a very a, f a dear friend of mine, who I knew very well, a, path a super, a amazingly qualified pathologist. Ended up being pathologist for um, St. John Hospital, Dr. Hume. Yes. And uh, he did an autopsy. This was the first autopsy on a gunshot case that he had ever done in his life. Oh, my goodness. And uh, that's not good. Why was that? Well, because he was a, a, um, he was a captain in the Navy. That's a high, very high rank. And the uh, Navy told him to do this autopsy, and he did. He sa I asked him, why did you? He said, because when some general or some, uh, some uh, high, very, very high-ranking officer tells you to do something in the armed forces, you do it. You don't ask questions. <laughs> OK? I so uh, he assumed that the wound in the neck that the president had was an entrance bullet wound. Of course, we know that he was hit with one wound in the back of the right shoulder. We also know that he had a wound in the head. But this was, according to him at that time, a third bullet wound. And the only way that this could have happened, according to putting all the items together, is that he was hit in the back of the right shoulder, he was hit in the back of the head, and he was hit in the front, in the front of the neck, by where under or next to the uh, knot of the tie. If that were the case, he would have had to have been caught in a crossfire. A crossfire means he was shot from the front, he was shot from the back. They were waiting for him to pass at a certain uh, a moment in a certain through a certain place, and both people from the front and the back shot at him, and ca caught him in a cro in in this crossfire. Mm -hmm. That would mean a conspiracy, mm -hmm. but there was no conspiracy. There was no. This was not an entrance wound. This was an exit wound. Only at that time, somebody who was not specifically trained in forensic pathology would not have known that. He was an excellent pathologist to make a determination of whether something is cancer or something is not, or what kind of cancer it was, and things like that. But as far as bullet wounds are concerned, he did not know very much. And at that time, that is what forensic pathology was like in America. Don't forget, this occurred in 1963, in, in November of 1963. Uh, at that time, in, in 1963, put forensic pathology in America was in its infancy. And CSI and Quincy and all these shows that have developed since took off on that. And today, forensic pathology is like other specialties in medicine in America at its peak. At its, and it's not really at its peak because it continues to develop. Well, in my opinion, I think if they were doing the right things in Hollywood, they would make a show based upon your life and your experiences. It would be high, the top rated show. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> uh, I, I would like to ask you about so many of your experiences. And I, I, I love what you had just said. It puts everything together. Um, could you tell our viewers a little bit about your practice now? My practice now is that I consult. I've re I have 
uh, here in Michigan, I worked for the county of Wayne uh, in Detroit for uh, 16 or 17 years, and then for the county of Macomb. And uh, I retired from the county of Wayne. I retired from the county of Macomb. From the last job in Macomb, I retired in 2004. And you may know, my son then took that over. And uh, I think he's doing a fabulous job over there in Macomb County. They built, uh, I mean, they, the building that the county built him is, uh, I call it the Taj Mahal, because <laughs> it's a wonderful building with a wonderful pa forensic pathologist that they have. And, um, uh, and at the time that you were brought on to, to be a part of the um, forensic pathology program in Macomb County, it wasn't that way at all. No, it, it was, was the one room <laughs> where no ventilation, um, poor refrigeration, um, nothing to, uh, to uh, make uh, the work appealing. I mean, it's 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 a nasty. It's not nasty for me, but it's nasty for everybody else who come there. And people would have to come and identify the body at the exact same place where I do the autopsy. And as you have said before, disrespectful to the deceased. It's disrespectful to the deceased. It's disrespectful to the community at large when you when when this is so undignified as to. Uh, have to cover a body with uh, that is during an autopsy where it's co we cover it with a sheet but the blood from the autopsy still comes through and the relatives come and look at the body come on that's not the way to do it I want to uh, uh, before we close I want to ask you what inspires you to to still carry on your active work schedule today well, I do consulting worldwide. Um, yeah, worldwide, but mostly, of course, in this area, and some of it in other in other states, and also in other countries. I look forward to my going to work. I have gone fishing. I have done all the other things that people do when they are retired. But you know, nothing satisfies me, and I have. N I don't look forward to to. Uh, a holiday every day of my life when I'm retired. I am working and I enjoy my work. I can't wait on Sunday night for it to be Monday morning and I know that I have to be at work at 9 o'clock and I'm there. And uh, I would not change it for anything. <clears throat> I think that's an inspiration t to me and to everybody and, and uh, I think that's wonderful. I can tell you one thing, in, uh, which is a fact. Every one of my friends, similar age, who, uh, with whom I talk, they all envy me for working. So what is my advice? If you, don't, if you are physically and mentally capable, continue working. Great advice for us all, including myself. <laughs> I, Dr. Spitz, I'm so honored that you took time out to, to be here today. In, in my mind, you're just a legendary, wonderful person who uh, ha has just a fascinating career, and it's a treat for me to have you here. Thank you very much. And a treat for our viewers as well, I know. And I want to thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. <laughs> I, am, uh, I appreciate having been invited. Thank you very much. And thank you to our viewers as well. We always appreciate that you tune in to watch our show. Take good care of yourself and those around you, and have a great day.